Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to a Future of Education interview that has become a part of the Learning 2.0 conference. It's the fourth day of the conference. If my voice sounds a little hoarse, you probably won't be surprised. It's been a total blast. We've had a, a ton of fun. And I'm delighted to welcome Gordon Dryden to the show. Gordon's book, newest book, is Unlimited, The New Learning Revolution and the Seven Keys to Unlock It. Welcome, Gordon. Yeah, and thank you for inviting me along, Steve. Really delighted to have you here. The future of education Good to be here from New Zealand, way, way down on the South Pacific. Yes, really glad to have you coming in and actually glad, appreciative of the fact that you have dealt with a computer failure and have gone to a friend's house in order to be with us. <laughs> oh, well, it's good to be. That's what, that's, what, that's what it's all about. The Future of Education is a Web 2.0 Labs project. Thanks to Mighty Bell and Blackboard Collaborate for in-kind support. Uh, coming up, uh, you, we are in the middle of the Learning 2.0 conference, so that's obviously not coming up, but that's at learning20.com. We still have one more day. Tomorrow we have some really terrific events that start with Angela Myers. Uh, we have Sugana Mitra coming on the show. We have um, Heidi Hayes Jacobs. Um, rescheduling, so she's after Sugana Mitra tomorrow. Lots and lots of fun, and the recordings are, are going up immediately after each session, so there's something there from all of the preceding days. This is Connected Educator Month, a program of the United States Department of Education, and we're glad to be supporting that effort. The Future of Libraries Conference is October 3rd through 5th. Again, this is a free conference. It's a two-day conference. It typically has about 150 sessions. You can learn more about it at library20.com, a terrific event. And the, the Mothership event, the Global Education Conference that Lucy Gray and I run, five days, 24 hours a day, four to 500 sessions, is November 12th to 16th. We encourage you to uh, look at that as well. It's globaleducationconference.com. Both the Library 2.012 Conference and the Global Education Conference are still accepting proposals for presentations, and we encourage you to consider doing that. And either way, we hope that you will attend. So coming up tomorrow, as I said, Angela Myers. Oh, yes, and Audrey Waters is going to give a fascinating talk. Can't wait for that. Uh, she's my podcast partner, and it's a terrific um, uh, presentation. Cheryl Nussbaum Beach is also providing a keynote. So got Amitra, Heidi Hayes Jacobs, Tony Wagner from Harvard comes on at the end of the month to talk about his new book, Creating Innovators. We're going to talk about entrepreneurship today. And because of the keynote session we had this morning from Yang Zhao, I think we've got a sort of a, a very powerful trio of discussions around this. Michael Strong talks about Socratic teaching, entrepreneurism, and education. Ronald Walk on wasting minds. Anyway, there's lots there, hopefully something that interests you. If you've missed any of the shows, there are somewhere close to 300 by now. All of the events from uh, Learning 2.0 are up in the full Blackboard Collaborate recording and also an MP3 form. If you go to futureofeducation.com, I've listed them all there, there are many of the most recent ones. Again, ho hopefully something that makes a difference for you in your day. Okay, now to the left of the map, you should see some icons. You're looking for the star icon. And fascinatingly, I, oh, I do have it there. It's the second one down. You click on that and you click on the map. Give a shout out in the chat as well. Let Gordon know where you're participating from. Do we have anybody else from New Zealand or Australia or Asia and the Pacific? Oh, there's Australia. Los Angeles, Georgia, Melbourne, Boca Raton, looks like two in Australia. I'm thinking there's a Hawaii over there as well. Serbia. 
New Jersey, Saskatchewan, Northern Saskatchewan, Santa Cruz, California. Hey, maybe our. Uh, I think that's the same Australia. Well, we'll we'll enjoy it as the room grows, the show goes on. Thanks so much for being here. If you're listening to the recording, we sure do appreciate it. So, Gordon, the first thing to say about this book is that I think you and Jeanette, your co-author, really like the number seven. Well, we like the number seven mainly because we worked out that in the last three or four years that we figured about four years ago that there were seven main features that were about to change the world beyond recognition. In fact, I might say that since then, in the last four years, we've actually added to that. So we'll cover another two today as well. So we've advertised seven, but in fact, we're going to add two more because uh, the way the world is changing uh, and the way that all those changes will impact on education, I believe, are, going to, are already, as from your own sessions, changing the world of education more than it has changed in the last four or five hundred years. It is interesting, those of us who've been sort of actively uh, involved in this discussion about technology, the change in education, it certainly feels as though even in the last six months there's been a sea change of recognition about some of the points that you make in the book. Have you felt the same? Very much so, and uh, in my opinion the changes are coming in the main from at one end of the scale from the two biggest nations in the world, the most populous nations, that's China and uh, India, uh, and at uh, the other end they're coming most dramatically from very small countries, and if I had to pick out two or three I would choose my own country, New Zealand, uh, particularly in the field of interactive, the use of interactive communications in a digital way. Number two would be Finland, so Finland and New Zealand both about you know between four and five million people also some aspects of Singapore and other aspects of Hong Kong so those places very much in a similar size are leading in certain ways but China and India are then leapfrogging ahead in other ways uh, in the field of uh, one of the, the, the seventh and eighth major steps in my opinion that we've added in number one would be in the mobile field and when we wrote the book Unlimited four years ago, The Unlimited Revolution, at that stage there were only three billion people in the world had mobile phones. Now there are six billion, and overwhelmingly those are in China, at over one billion people have a mobile phone, and 70% of people in China now access the internet through their mobile phones, and India is very close behind them. So in many ways, China will, in my view, lead the world both in mobile technology, but in the field of education, it dramatically is already leading in the way in which parenting education, parent education at home and spending is the biggest by far in the world. The average family in China today spends 33% of its total income, 33% of its total family income on the education of its one child and they are now racing ahead in the field of digital technology and especially in their richest city in Shanghai. So that's just one example of how a country which if you go back to the year 2000 only 4% of homes in China had a telephone, uh, only 12% of the people in the world had a mobile phone. Now there are one billion Chinese have a mobile phone and rapidly increasing in the field of having a smartphone. And again, the way in which that will transform uh, education in China is just We've dramatic. watched an interesting phenomenon here in the United States as these technologies are providing a moment of shifting where small institutions are specializing in uh, learning pedagogies and redefining themselves and, and I feel as though we're going to watch um, those schools shift places. Do you think that's true in the world with countries as well? 
It is. It varies in country by country, but it also varies school by school. There's, there's not one school in the world that I know that isn't, well, there's not one school system that has introduced even half of what is available now. But in each country, you have pockets that are doing dramatic things. Let me give an example from my own country, which I'm most familiar with, New Zealand. In the year uh, 1990, New Zealand introduced a program called Tomorrow's Schools, in which every one of our schools became a charter school. Uh, a, and every charter, this public and private, each school uh, had a charter with the government, of which half the charter was to uh, abide by the, natural, the, the national curriculum guidelines. We don't have a we don't have textbooks in primary school or elementary school here. We have curriculum guidelines. But the other half of the charter was to decide what each school would become, would, would excel in. And many, many schools decided to excel on how to use the new digital interactive technologies as catalysts to rethink education. And in that way, we now have, in New Zealand, in my opinion, some of the best schools in the world that have excelled at that, not using technology for the sake of worshipping technology, but how can you use the technology in a creative way? And I believe that is where we, in fact, lead the world, because if you do it in a creative way, let me give examples. There are many schools in New Zealand now which where at the age of six, the first year in grade one, the students start the first day in grade one by using um, video cameras to video and shoot their, their friends at school to find out what their kids want to excel in. By day two or day three, they are learning to edit that video. Now, I'm a, I'm a television and radio producer. I've been involved in television for more than 50 years. I find in my country, six and seven-year-olds are better at editing video at the age of six and seven than I am after 50 years in the profession because they have used that from the very first day at school. From about the third or fourth day, they're using technology for um, producing animations. And within a week or two, they're starting to use uh, the technology um, to produce, uh, to actually create their own music. So if you can shoot your own video, you can edit your own video, you can add the soundtrack to your own video, including original creative tools, then you are on the first stage for a new creative revolution. And I believe that's where the technology, we're now seeing those changes taking place, where you can use technology in so many creative ways. And if you can scale those up, so you can transform education in India or China, or let's say the two biggest countries in Africa, Nigeria and uh, Ethiopia. In one case, you're talking about almost 100 million people, another one, 90 million people. If you can scale that creativity up around the world, the results are going to be fabulous. every time a school district here in the United States announces that they're spending 10 or $20 million to buy iPads for the students, there's kind of a collective groan. Um, there's this tension between believing technology will transform education and... I think that... Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Please go ahead. Yeah. I think that stems, if, if I may be critical of the American system, America has got the best, eight of the ten best research universities in the world on one end of the scale. On the other end of your scale, in the public school system, I, I, I hope you don't mind me being critical, um, but I've been, I've been in and out of the United States for, coming in and out of the United States for about 50 years now. Um, and the American school system is, uh, the public school system from you know, elementary school, middle school and high school, is very much amazingly to the rest of the world, you worship standardized testing. <laughs> That's just about a joke in the rest of the world. The, the rest of the world admires America for non-standardized innovation. We all think Silicon Valley is incredible. 
and yet the land of non-standardized innovation, that which you lead the world in, is in fact worships standardized testing. And that is, that if you're looking at the kind of creative tools that I'm talking about, or using technology in creative ways, and not just regurgitating standardized test results, um, then people think about technology as being standardized testing so that you're just having kids watching a computer screen to learn the answers to standardized tests. But that's not the way the rest of the world is going, and that's not the way the brighter schools in the world are going, and it's certainly not the way that Stanford University goes, or Carnegie Mellon's going, or the incredible jobs at uh, MIT. MIT, uh, you know, Media Lab up there is just doing incredible things, but your school system is still very much, that's standardized testing. <laughs> That's almost a joke. Gordon, I want to give some dealing. context to the book. People can't uh, see, but this is a very large, uh, very colorful, beautiful book. Um, and it's based on, is this maybe the third iteration, based on what you call the world's fastest selling book? What's been the history of this material? Well, first of all, you're probably aware, or you personally, but I better explain it. I'm not, a, I'm not an educator. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a school principal. I'm a, basically, I'm a journalist. I'm a multimedia journalist with my background in, in television and in radio, radio talk shows, television talk shows, and investigative journalism. Um, and in 1990, I managed to get a grant of $2 million uh, in New Zealand from our biggest charitable foundation to open up a public debate in our country uh, on radio and on television and on the newspapers and around schools to open up a public debate on the future of education. That included me going around the world for two years with a, a professional television crew and shooting the best of education around the world as it appeared then in 19, 1990. We then turned those into um, six one-hour television documentaries, which also became the basis for a, um, an online and, uh, and also around the schools debate on education. Um, at the time that I was doing that, uh, among other things, I sat next to an American doctor of education, Dr. Jeanette Voss, who was originally born, she was born in Holland, then went to school in Canada, and then got her doctorate in the United States. And the amazing thing was we discovered that what I was shooting around the world on videotape, Jeanette was actually doing her doctorate on new methods of learning. She had spent seven years on that. When we then swapped our research results, um, we decided that we might have hit on something. And we turned that into a book called The Learning Revolution. And The Learning Revolution, for which there have been seven, uh, sorry, six editions so far, uh, that became the top-selling book the top-selling non-fiction book in the world, <laughs> mainly or solely because it sold initially uh, 10.2 million copies in China, and 10 million of those were sold in seven months alone, which made it not only the biggest-selling non-fiction book, but it became the fastest-selling non-fiction book. Other places, we then had 26. We've had 26 editions of that have been published in 26 languages around the world of which in Scandinavia, in countries like Denmark, particularly Sweden, but also Finland, it became a very, very big uh, uh, seller. And my co-author, Jeanette Voss, who is a teacher by profession, uh, a top teacher, and is brilliant in many, many fields, including uh, the, use of, uh, uh, the use of music in education, she ran seminars right throughout um, uh, Scandinavia, while I did a lot of work in China, uh, Southeast Asia, Mexico, and New Zealand. So we've had six editions of that book, and then uh, four years ago we decided to turn it into a full color book, uh, and now we're in the process of turning that full color book into a video, uh, a video touch screen book. So we'll have it uh, out within the next uh, 18 months in that field, where there will be you touch you touch your color photograph and you see a color video to show what you're doing. A bit like the kind of things that you're doing every day when you're when you're discussing this on on air. So that's the the new book is called Unlimited: The New Learning Revolution and the Seven Keys to Unlock It. So we have particularly zeroed in on those seven keys. Um, and if you'd like to go through those, and I would like to do that, but I would like to do ask you a couple of other questions quickly before we get there. 
as you You're look right. at some of the ways in which countries are doing good things around the world, do you feel any sense of accomplishment that the book, that the different versions, editions of the book have made a difference in certain places? And where might you identify that? The, well, first of all, in New Zealand, they've made, they made quite a dramatic difference, uh, and I'm being immodest here, but that happened to be so because of the television programs that went with them that, that actually were the prelude to that. Those television programs were on network television, the main network at, in, in the at prime time on Sunday nights, and then they were followed up by radio discussions and a lot of other seminars around the country. So they became quite a model for achievement there. When the book first came out, by a most incredible, um, <laughs> most incredible set of circumstances, in the uh, Singapore is about the same population in New Zealand, but is a very small island. I mean, you can drive around Singapore in a day, where New Zealand, at the same population as Singapore, uh, ha is the same size as Japan or of the United Kingdom. Uh, Singapore, amazingly, at the time that our book came out. The main Singapore teaching university was moved its site from the centre of Singapore to a new building and a new camp, new giant campus. And it so happened that a New Zealand businessman was in Singapore at that stage on other work, uh, met up with some school people there, because Singapore has been the leading country in Southeast Asia to attract international businesses to go to Singapore and use them as the, as, it, as the headquarters for Asia. Uh, that particular businessman, uh, who, a New Zealander whom I happen to know, um, was approached by one, a, a Chinese teacher there, a school principal, to take over the Singapore University campus as it was and turn it into a, a new school. And they bought first of all, 500 copies of our book and decided to use that as the model for establishing what is now the world's biggest international baccalaureate school. It's called the, the, uh, the Overseas Family School. It's like so many of the international schools in Singapore, it is the, it's only allowed to cater for, for students of international families, of which there are now about two million of those families in Singapore. Um, at the same time, I, I became very much involved as a consultant with them, and we were together very much involved in setting up that school as what is now the world's biggest international baccalaureate school. And the international baccalaureate curriculum is one, particularly for primary years, which is from age three through to the end of elementary school, that's ideal for introducing a lot of these new methods in which which we've done in Singapore. So those are two examples. Probably the other Scandinavian countries are the ones that have used it most in terms of teacher retraining. I'm intrigued that the, uh, I, I didn't know about you really until a couple of months ago. And my sense is that that may be true of many of people in the audience. Um, and I'm reminded kind of of Edward Deming, who was the total quality guru, who made such an impact in Japan, but was virtually unknown in his own country. Is there a reason that there, you wouldn't have more visibility in the United States? That's right, yeah. Um, it, uh, well, America's got the, you know, the best and the worst of everything. As I say, you've got the best international uh, research um, universities there. Uh, incredible online stuff now. I mean, MIT is doing you know university stuff all around the world online. So you really do do enormous stuff there. And America itself, of course, is 50 countries all in one. You got you got the whole universe there at the same time. But I really put it down to the fact that that the American public school system has comes back to amazingly this standardised testing. I mean, standardised testing in the land of non-standardised innovation is just quite quite amazing. You should be leading in the field of innovation and, and education. Um, and there are so many books on education as there are in so many self-improvement books in America. I, th I think you have 600 different religions in America, so you have, you're probably the most religious society in the world, of the Western world. Um, so you have so many of those things are competing, and of course you have the two 
biggest school systems, which are in California and in uh, Texas, which tend to dominate the textbooks in America. Uh, in You take the international baccalaureate schools around the world, which are very much international schools, in the primary elementary years, they don't use textbooks. They, they actually look at a total subject for a, a global subject for six weeks, and all the other subjects are blended into that. So you may have six weeks on planets of the universe for grade, say, eight-year-olds in grade two or three. You might have endangered species for six weeks, and you'll be looking at that. You'll be having looking at the human body and how it works, or the water system of the world. So those enable you to have innovation for technology inside those. Uh, and America hasn't really moved that way. The, for instance, you take the most creative company in the world today, would, I, I think without a doubt be Apple. I mean, that's Steve Jobs' legacy for the world. It has been all those create, creative. And he reinvented six industries, from music through to movies. But when Apple... When the Mac first came out in 1984, the year later, Steve Jobs introduced the ACOT program, the Apple Classrooms of Tomorrow. And that was a five-step program which started off ostensibly to use technology. But in fact, unfortunately, most schools, and including Apple at that stage, they patched the new technology on this very, very old standardized testing system. New Zealand went the other way around. We took the five steps, and the, the last step that the ACOT, Apple Classrooms of Tomorrow, the last step was, hey, maybe this will actually revolutionize education. And we, we jumped right onto that and said, hey, well, hold on. We have this technology here now. How can we use that to revolutionize education? America hasn't been through that step, certainly on primary schooling. It has it. Let's say the most dramatic one uh, would have been Carnegie Mellon. It's about, gee, about eight years ago now that Carnegie Mellon decided to completely get rid of boring lectures. So they reorganized the entire university. Uh, but you haven't done that in most of your primary school or elementary school. Well, let's school move into the book. And uh, as an overview, the fact that it's titled Unlimited gives a sense of the optimism here in the positive moment. You've said this, this, the changes will change the world beyond recognition. Um, it seems to unlimited potential. Unlimited it potential. It seems to me that history favors the winner, and the technology pretty typically wins. So, is it important to be optimistic now versus look fear-based? Um, well, I, I certainly believe so. In my own country, I've known as probably the, the eternal optimist. Um, I ran radio, daily radio talk shows for 10 years and uh, two or three television talk shows a week, so I was probably known as the, the poor man's Oprah around my country for a while, and I'm certainly a great optimist. I believe for the first time in history that everything that utopians dreamed about when I was a kid, everything is now possible. And for some strange reason, um, the the financial the financial system in the world is telling us that we are we're in the middle of a, a depression. You only have to go from one side of the United States to the other to see go from Wall Street to see the results of that finan that financialization of society and some of the worst aspects of financialization. And go to the other side and see Silicon Valley, where you have the leaders, you know, leaders in the world of, of creative, using creative technology in brilliant ways. You know, you go from Google to Apple to Facebook, um, all those things which are changing the world. Uh, you look at YouTube, for instance, one of the great creative tools of the world, the great ways to assemble information. Uh, there are four billion videos viewed every video views every day on YouTube. What creative tools that are going together? Most of them put together by brilliant young students, and those tools are now available to being shared with the rest of the world. Um, look at Salman Khan, the Khan Academy. Just one person who is brilliant in mathematics himself. He has his own complete channel on YouTube. You can learn any aspect of mathematics you want. 
in his own particular way of communicating it to you. So those are the things that give me incredible optimism to change the world because it, it, you've only got to look at YouTube and Google to see how those innovations can now be scaled up. They can be scaled, which is exactly what Silicon Valley looks at all the time. You want to make a presentation to a Silicon Valley venture capitalist, and the first thing they want to know is how simple is it, how big is it, you know, how can it, how can it be scaled, and how fast is it. So those are the three keys to Silicon Valley, and in my opinion, they are also three of the keys to using the same creative thinking methods for education. Okay, so as you can Pretty see on simple, the cover really. of the book, there are these seven catalysts, and I'm thinking, are there now nine? And why don't we have you briefly go through those and describe what you're seeing? Let me go through them for a start. Let me go through for a start then. The first one is everything now is global. Everything that you can dream up now, you come up with a brilliant new idea and you can turn it almost instantly, you can turn it into a global leadership. I mean, you would never heard of Wikipedia 12 years ago. We'd never heard of Facebook. We had heard of Google, but we hadn't heard of Google by 1998. We'd never heard of Google before then. Look at what Google now is became global. Look at what one guy did, Tim Berners-Lee, with the World Wide Web. He took some of American innovations, and when he was in Switzerland, he turned them into the World Wide Web, a global method of communication. No one owns it. No one knows who owns it. It's, it's brilliant. Chaotic, it's called. Chaos and, chaos and order all going together at the same time. So global is one of the things. It's now possible to take all the best learning ideas and make them available almost instantly to almost anyone on earth. So global is the first one. Number two would be interactive. The way in which now you don't learn by listening to boring lectures and following you know, standardized tests from standardized textbooks. I mean, the textbooks are changing every day. What we know about the world is changing every day. But now you can interact with it. So instead of just learning by reading about something, I'm a traditional journalist. I, 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 my own personal library has about 10,000 books in it, and I download stuff every day. But now you can interact with it. You can become a scientist. You can actually go online, and you can actually learn anything online in an interactive way. Let me give two examples of that. I happen to play chess, and I happen to play bridge. Um, I can now play against the computer. I can go and play against the world champion at bridge, Omar Sharif's interactive bridge game, a contract bridge. You can learn that online by using the, one of the world's best bridge players as your tutor. At any time you want to check a move, what should you do next to bid a card or make a move, you can check with them. You can get a hint from the world's best player. If you want to replay a hand, you can replay it. And you'll learn 20 times faster. If you want to learn bridge, uh, sorry, a chess, um, then Kasparov, the world's greatest chess player, has a bridge system. And you can dial into that at any level, from beginner to world master. I could knock off Kasparov up to about level four. From level five onwards, I'm done. I'm a complete idiot. But as, as you go up and increase, you can learn at any level from beginner. Now you just take those two examples, how to use the world's best teachers, marry them together with, with the world's best interactive technology students, and you can turn them into learning games. So global is number one. Interactive is number two. You want to explore I, those? I or think you want me to given go the timing, together? let's have you go through them. Because I do want to talk briefly yep. about teaching, reform, and entrepreneurship. And so if we can go through these, touch on those others, and we'll sure. open it for Q&A. And then we'll leave people wanting more. OK, then. I will then go through them quickly. So global number one, interactive number two. Personal is number three. We all have a different learning style, and we all we all have or each has an incredible ability to be to excel at something. You only have to look at the Olympic Games to see that there are something like 200 different 
different skills and uh, of of uh, learning to become an Olympic champion, but we all have a way of becoming a, pers a personal achiever. And we also now know how to put those together into multi-talented teams. That's what the whole revolution is about. Number four, the world is now instant. You can get instant, for instant information. Uh, if you know the system called atomic learning, that has a hundred different applications that you can learn the tutorials online that if you're learning something like uh, it might well be iMovie, how to edit movies, and you get you're stumped, you can't remember what is stage 10, you can go online and play a tutorial for that. So instant education is on. Number five, we can now share information very easily, and Wikipedia is the great example of that, the world's biggest encyclopedia. 20 million, 20 million different articles which are updated every day, so it can be easily shared. The next one is free. You can share them free. Wikipedia is one. Google gives you away free information, and then it sells the it sells the extra stuff to go with it. And number se number seven, the world is now co-creative, so it's not just easily shared. You can actually create things together. And if you take just two examples of that, of course, is the Linux system from from uh, uh, Finland, whereby the people together decided to make their own computer program. So in China now, you can buy a computer, buy a laptop without an operating system, and you can download a Linux system. In one of our schools in New Zealand, called a, a senior high school here, it is completely an open source school where all the students themselves work with software and online applications which are completely free. So those are the seven stages, those things that go together to make up the, the original, of what we thought was the learning revolution. And the two that we would add now are the ones that would be mobile, and the whole world of mobile technology. And the, uh, the second one of that would be social with Facebook, you know, uh, one billion people on Facebook and you're working together on those things. So again, for education, you put those nine things together and you'll change your, the world. Your interview is a part of this Learning 2.0 conference, which is a part of this Connected Educator Month. And part of the goal is to bring visibility to the networking potential and capabilities for educators to build a network. Do you want to talk about the potential for students to build learning networks? Yeah, well, I believe that's going to be one of the major ones. And one of the things we want to do with our book, if, by the way, if people would like to see and read the first, uh, you know, the first introduction to it, the uh, you can see the photographs, etc. It's free online if you go to our website, which is dub 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 the learning web the learning web dot net that you go on there and you can download a copy free and you'll see the way it's laid out on every page there is a color photograph inside a box which gives you an overview uh, as you know I'm a television producer and you put, you put it up on the screen there the learning web there's the color of the book and you can click on that you can click and read the first 34 pages completely free you can see an interview on it from part that's on YouTube, and you can hear a whole series of radio interviews there. Now that's that's free of charge. You can do those things, but then we're going to establish in the very, but in the next six months an international competition for students through Facebook and on YouTube to change those photographs into touch screen videos. So that you can see if you are in New Zealand, for instance, and see six-year-olds who are producing, shooting videos, editing videos, and producing videos about any, any topic, the history of New Zealand, or the history of America, or the history of China or Korea, you will be able to, to enter a competition of which some of the prizes are trips to New Zealand, by the way, to fly out to New Zealand, to see how we produce Lord of the Rings in New Zealand, which is the three-part movie series with uh, 13 Academy Awards in one in one night of world record, uh, and the same the same studios are now producing. Well, they've already produced all the animations for Avatar. It's a very big industry here, the 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 movie industry. But again, they have a workshop there to teach people how to do these things. So again, we want to have a networking system 
whereby the future of education can be determined by the brightest teachers in the world and the brightest students in the world. Now I know that you've had Mark Prinsky, you know, one of your great uh, producers of learning technology, you've had him on your series for the last few days. Mark Prinsky, M-A-R-C, P-R-E-N-S-K-Y, Mark has a brilliant, uh, a whole brilliant program for the students of the world reinventing education through networks and I agree with him 1000%. So let's talk a little bit about um, effective teaching. What's your vision of how that would take place now? Well, first of all, I would not think of instruction. You still use the word instruction in the United States. I have not heard the word instruction mentioned in a New Zealand elementary school for the last 20 years. So it's not a matter of a teacher instructing students. I happen to start the other way around, and perhaps again this is my journalistic background. I think every young, every student and every teacher should think of students now as being multimedia journalists. We have the tools now, not only to store all the world's information in almost any form and to make it available almost instantly, but more importantly we have the tools in which students can explore that information. They can explore it, first of all, by making the world as their classroom. I call it the new 80-20 rule. Only 20% of a school student's time in a year is spent in a traditional school classroom. On the other 80% of those students' time, they're already, they, they use their mobile phone every day, they're texting every 10 minutes, they're learning to use video cameras, they're learning how to edit video, and in the main it will be the 80% of time outside schools that will be the main learning periods because it is there that you can explore the whole world. We have um, several schools in New Zealand, we have two in particular which uh, the schools have been set up uh, where they use the entire city and the entire almost the province around about as their classroom. If they want to become a botanist they can go and study at the local botanical gardens. So I believe that we will put, talk less about instruction, less about teaching, and more about enthusing students to become self-motivated and self-activated learners by creating their own tools and their own results. That will be the big one. So in the book you talk about um, a new recipe for secondary school reform. What is that? Secondary school reform, I think, is, is uh, hopefully the same way as uh, universities have reformed themselves. Let's take a classic example from one of the ones I know well in the United States. Arizona State University is the first one that I know in America, other than the big, research, big eight research universities. California State University has said, why should we have only university courses in particular subjects so that you get a degree in a particular subject when you study a particular subject. The big challenges in the world today are to change systems. Who, how do we change the world banking system? How do we change the world currency system where we have a whole gambling casino which is taking the world down? We know that. Everyone knows that. The world financial system and banking system is completely corrupt and, and collapsing. The whole climate business in the world, the whole energy system in the world it needs major, major, major changes. So the university, the Arizona State University says take your degree by solving one of those main problems. Now in some of our test schools in New Zealand at universities we've switched over completely to integrated study programs whereby again you look at major subjects and major systems and your students go out and collectively study those. That has struck a lot of opposition, I might say, from the traditional high school teachers who tend to be subject-based teachers. So it's a matter of the challenge is how do we marry those two things together? How do we marry together what we already do in our elementary schools, which is look at subjects, and the subject, the, the the school systems that I would look at most for that are the, look up the International Baccalaureate, the IBO.org. 
and their primary schools program and their middle schools program and then their then their baccalaureate diploma program are all very much involved around that total system, the totality of looking at a project that needs to be done, and you're doing this in some schools in America with project-based learning, your, uh, uh, your high-tech high, high school, particularly in uh, San Diego, is brilliant on that, the way in which all the students are looking at projects to get involved in. So that's, that's the way in which Have I would approach Have you seen examples that. from other countries that might help inform those who are interested in student uh, learning agency or do-it-yourself learning? Do-it-yourself learning. I would say that uh, in, in it's, if you look at the, the, the PISA examinations, PISA, which is the, the, uh, the program for an international student assessment, the school system that comes out tops of that and has done for the last 12 years now is Finland. And Finland is very similar to New Zealand except that it doesn't specialize in technology. It specializes in actually the students going out and using the world as their classroom. A lot of collaborative learning together. They normally have three classes working together with three teachers in one. So they're working together in that. So they have one model. Uh, New Zealand has that other model, as I say, of having some very good uh, digital classrooms and digital schools, but they're mainly creative classrooms. They don't think of themselves as technology. They think the technologies are just the tools for doing that. The international baccalaureate schools, there are some excellent ones. I mentioned Singapore before. Hong Kong has a brilliant one. Hong Kong, if you look it up, Discovery College. Discovery College in Hong Kong, which is on Discovery Island, which is where most of the international pilots live here in, in, the, in Hong Kong, is absolutely brilliant. The school system that I'm much more involved in in your area of the world, which would be in Mexico. And in Mexico, the Thomas Jefferson Institute is absolutely brilliant. They now have, uh, with one coming up in the next couple of weeks, they have four campuses in four different cities. And those campuses are from early childhood through to senior high school. They have a dual language system. And they, again, use our book, The Learning, the Learning uh, uh, Revolution, and now the Unlimited. Uh, they've, they've used that as a model for about the last five years. I've been a consultant to them for five years. I don't speak Spanish, but everyone at the school, they have a total immersion course in English for four- and five-year-olds at kindergarten. And half of each day is in Spanish and half of it is in English. So they're absolutely brilliant in putting these things together. If you look at their website in Spanish, it's the Instituto Thomas Jefferson. So if you look at www.itj, itj.edu, MX for Mexico, the Thomas Jefferson Institute, they are the only school in the world that I know of that is actually invited each year to both the Apple International uh, Learning uh, Summit and to the, um, the Microsoft one as well. So they're absolutely brilliant, and they're absolutely brilliant on the use of interactive whiteboards. They have a smart board in every classroom and Gordon, them together in that way. We're going to go to Q&A so now. We've got about model. 10 minutes left. If you have a question for Gordon, feel free to raise your virtual hand. That's the third icon over in the participant window. Or to put your question in the chat. While we're waiting for some questions, if you were able to give one piece of advice to a United States teacher, what would it be? I would suggest that the to be the best teachers in America and the best school systems in America should look at Silicon Valley. I would look at what Apple has done, what Steve Jobs and uh, and Johnny Ives and uh, uh, Tim Cook, their present chief, what they've done, what they've achieved in the last since at, since Jobs came back to Silicon Valley in 1997 and worked in with his brilliant designer from Britain, uh, 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 Ives, uh, Johnny Ives, brilliant designer, and they started off with challenging, challenging the whole system. Steve Jobs said, we are now living in the digital lifestyle age, and what do we need to change to, to lead that? And they started off with the, with the iMac, 
and they really moved into music then, the, I, the, the iPod and the iTunes system, and they reinvented six entire industries. Jobs reinvented six entire industries. Now, if one guy can reinvent six industries, then 27 million, uh, sorry, 57 million school teachers around the world, 2.7 million of them in the United States, surely you can reinvent schooling. <laughs> We'd like to hope that our book is at least one of the starting points, but uh, uh, if he can reinvent six inside about ten years and change the world forever, then boy, what can you do collectively as school teachers, particularly if you we have a love-hate relationship students. here with Silicon Valley and education because of an enormous amount of money getting poured into what appear to be commercial opportunities in education. So we're, we'll keep thinking about that and following it up because I don't think that was your point, but there is this tension. I think the I think the last point on that would be in, would be the applications that are there. For instance, Apple now has a half a mi over half a million applications. A lot of them are in music and small things, but I don't. Want, in New Zealand, we've managed to work out about three schools have worked out there are 180 of those applications which in total would cost you only 120 bucks all told and they almost cover interactively any of the subjects you should look at so if you want to start even looking at subjects like science uh, creativity geography mathematics etc then you can find applications for those 180 of them at a total cost of 120 bucks and you can get a lot of others from from android as well free of charge so just look at what the applications that are being developed and then see how you can use Gordon those Gordon Brandy classrooms. wants to know who is producing the best content on marrying accelerated learning and technology? Who's producing the best content? I think it, I think they're going in separate ways. Um, we hope to be doing that with our, with the, with the interactive technology version of the, of the unlimited book that we're, we're working on at the moment uh, because I think it will be produced collectively by people um, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are achievements in individual levels there are certain people doing um, well particularly Apple and Android with the applications that are there but you have to find them and the way in which those are then shared around I just mentioned those ones that there are. If you if you send a note through to me, we can send you a copy of these. My my, uh, you can send it to get my email address through our website. But if you look up if you look up Gordon Dryden anyhow, go on to YouTube and look up Gordon Dryden. You'll find the videos. And my email address is Gordon G O R D O N at learningweb dot c o dot n z or n z we call it in uh, in New Zealand, but n z at the end of it for New Zealand. Gordon at learningweb.co.nz and I'll send you a copy of those 180 applications and those things collectively are available on Apple on the iTunes uh, on the iTunes you know for you can buy them some of them are free and some of them you can buy for a dollar each and you can see it's, and those together will will help you um, in Australia there's a program called the study ladder look up study ladder and they're doing some incredibly good things of and you can buy a year's subscription for 50 bucks. You can see them free. Teachers get them free, but uh, go and see it anyhow. Study ladder. Study Gordon, ladder. We hear Maybe a lot something. about the need to teach creativity and innovation. Can creativity and innovation be taught, or do you provide an environment for it to arise? I think it depends on what kind of creativity you're talking about because there can be creativity in terms of a painter and you have to be want to be a painter. There's creativity and say my co-author is brilliant at using music incredibly well. I'm not good at that but I'm good at other sorts of things. Depends what you're doing. Um, Britain, is, the United Kingdom, has introduced innovation and entrepreneurship as a high school course about uh, five years ago and I was very fortunate to be chosen to run 10 one-day seminars on that and we found that the best way of teaching innovation in that level was to start off with the talent that everyone has and particularly school teachers uh, and we, I've worked out a total board game um, called the AHA game 
uh, which virtually is a Harvard Business School in your pocket or, or on, a, on a, a game board, but more importantly, it's how to take your talent and match it up and see what you can what you can learn from the rest of the world. If, for instance, you're a maths teacher, what can you learn from, for instance, Jan Davidson, who was a kindergarten teacher in California, whose specialty was teaching kids to read and write, and then she was the first person to introduce uh, two programs, interactive games for learning to read and write. So again, if you learnt if you learnt how to think in that way, how to how to take your talent and then see how you can turn that into different methods of learning. And you can generally learn those from other successful examples. So it's like taking Edward D. Bono, an old friend of mine, Edward D. Bono's uh, uh, tech, you know, his method of, uh, of lateral thinking. This is a lateral thinking whereby you can use the world's best existing models to as catalysts for your own Gordon, thinking. Gordon, what thinkers are you paying attention to right now? What thinkers am I paying attention to now? I'm I'm very much interested in those who are. I, I must admit to being a Silicon Valley fan. I've been in and out of Silicon Valley since before it was called Silicon Valley, and I just admire it greatly. I admire what's going on in South Korea. South Korea with Samsung is doing incredible work. They're they will do in Asia what Apple has really started in the United States. Samsung is brilliantly. I'm looking particularly at China in the field of open source technology. They're, they're brilliant at that. And I would look at Shanghai as where the action is taking place there. They they're, have some really great innovations there. India, I would think, I have great hopes in India because India started the wrong way round. They concentrated on university education, whereas China has concentrated on has concentrated almost entirely on making sure to wipe out illiteracy, to make sure that every kid is, a, is is literate. And they've started from that level. I believe that India will make incredible uh, take, take up challenges in an incredible way because 47% of Indian villages don't even have a school. So they have the opportunity to completely bypass the existing school system. If anyone is going to quickly learn how to introduce schools that are entirely different to traditional schools, uh, then India will probably, India and China will probably do that, and and South Korea will probably be there as well. I've, unfortunately, Finland has, if I might say this, uh, being an Apple man from way back. Finland has, I think, stupidly tied up with their their uh, Nokia system, which led the world in numbers. They've tied up with the uh, the Microsoft system. Uh, Finland has the opportunity to lead the world because they already have an incredible early childhood system. They and sweet Sweden are brilliant on early childhood systems. Every kid at school in Finland learns to speak three four languages fluently before leaving elementary school. And most kids in Sweden learn three languages before even starting school. So those are some of the models that I think will are already leading the world in some ways, and they will particularly lead the world in parenting education, the way that parents learn how to develop kids from the first from the first Gordon, few months of life. It's been really delightful to get to know you. I'm clapping for you. For those of you wondering where the elusive clapping button is, it's underneath the smiley face. You click on applause. <laughs> That's been just delightful. So the book is Unlimited, the New Learning Revolution. The, the, the sample chapters are available online. Can it be bought in the United States yet? No, but you can buy it online, and we subsidize we subsidize the air, the air freight to doing it there. So we can, we can air freight it to you. It's not much more than it would cost you to buy it in the United States if it was there. Uh, we did, we deliberately didn't put it in the United States because when the, as soon as the book came out, we realized that we should be it, it coincided with the collapse of the the straight printed book revolution, and we wanted to move almost as quick as we could into doing a touch screen video version of it to come up next. But the book itself can be then you can read it. You can read the start of it free online, and you've, you've shown the the website there. 
um, and you can see a few videos that go with that, and then you can order it online, and we subsidize it by, by slashing the price back almost to giving it to you at cost price plus the cost of the email from New Zealand. So that's one way, again, of, of doing instantly virtually instant uh, instant service rivaling Amazon. Gordon, I don't think this is the last time that we'll be talking with you, but thank you so much, and thanks for... The next time you'll see yeah. him in person, <laughs> the computer will be working. Okay. Really delightful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Folks, if you are looking for a session to attend, our next sessions are starting about a minute ago. Kristen Beck on connecting curriculum to real world situations, and Kane Novak on a guild of educators. Thanks to you for attending. Thanks to Gordon Dryden for enlightening us tonight. Take care. Have a great day wherever you are. Thanks, Gordon. Lovely to talk to you. Take care. Thanks, Dave.